interviewing the leading private equity executives and unlocking the secrets of success. Welcome to the Private Equity Podcast with Alex Rawlings. Hello, everybody. Joining us today is Oliver Gotcha, the founder and head of research at Perax, also an associate professor at HEC Paris, and also the academic dean at Trium Global Executive MBA. So lots, quite a bit there. So hopefully I got all that right. Um, but welcome and thank you very much for sharing your insights into the private equity industry, Oliver. My pleasure. So for those of uh, those who are listening who haven't heard of you before or aren't aware of you, if you could give us a kind of 60 to 90 second breakdown um, of you, if you could possibly ever get that in 60, 90 seconds, as I've just introduced you with three different job titles. So there may be a bit there. So I'll, I'll excuse a little bit of extra time there so we get a clear, uh, a clear picture of you. Certainly, certainly. So I've been uh, very passionate about understanding private equity for over 20 years now as a researcher. Um, I've been looking at this empirically as a professor at HEC Paris, studying questions related to risk and return of the asset class, trying to situate where the average is, but also more importantly, how to identify strong performance pockets. Um, my academic job right now, this is the second title, is basically uh, dedicated largely to this Trium Global Executive MBA program, where I work with senior executives in their 40s from all over the world on their on their MBA education and, and uh, the pedagogy there. Um, and then um, in business and in private equity, uh, I had the opportunity to create Parax as a dedicated service provider about a, de about a decade ago bring in some of the methods that I've designed in my research to the industry, making them applicable. All are centered around basically the analysis of private equity track records with the objective to identify the value creation DNA of a private equity fund manager. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So for those who haven't heard of Perax, um, you know, your specialty, specialist ad advisory firm, just give us a bit of an insight into to kind of what you guys do and uh, what the business provides to the private equity industry, please. Certainly. So Perox analyzes private equity track records, basically serving general partners um, with services mostly applicable in fundraising situations where we come in, we crunch the numbers, we process hard facts from the track record and play back a handful of key indicators that identify not only the how much of value creation, which is the easy part, but get it to the how identifying how value was created relative to a objectively derived peer group of other private equity firms, how much outperformance was there relative to the stock market, what we can read objectively about strategic positioning of the private equity firm, and then very importantly, integrate risk into the assessment. Okay. And you mentioned obviously about comparatively there. I mean, the performance of a private equity firm is usually heavily under lock and key um, and not particularly shared um, uh, by many. How do you guys go at looking at comparatively and, and then also getting into the, do you sometimes find it a challenge to actually get the data and the information from the PE firm, even though they've actually come to you to help and support them with that? Well, everything empirical in private equity always goes with my favorite metaphor from the one-eyed king in the land of the blind. Okay. Namely, um, private equity data is and probably will not in the foreseeable future ever be in fully complete, perfect, comprehensive, very dated. Um, and therefore, the very essence of the methodology that I've been der deriving, I've been basically acknowledging the imperfections of private equity data and trying to still get investors directionally relevant insights. So some people actually find my math surprisingly simple because there's not an exercise of doing something super sophisticated because that sometimes gives that false illusion that if you have really, really advanced mathematics, you think you get it right to the 17th post decimal. It's still private equity data. So I always remind people not to over interpret the post decimals and focus on the big picture and what you can say still with the admittedly imperfect data. Now, I'm in the fortunate position that I actually see a ton of data as a researcher. I've been gathering information confidentially from lots of investors for 20 years. There's a proprietary database at the university with over 20,000 private equity investments where I have underlying cash flows, sources of value. That's the fruit fly that inspires my academic work. And that frankly allowed me to kind of build my toolkit because I could see what methods actually work and are relevant for, for performance. Parox lives in a different world because basically it is living in the world with commercial data where I do get 
precise information from the specific client we work for, because they have an interest to share this with us under NDA and only for the project. And then we have to marry this information with benchmark information that is just commercially available. So there we basically are subject to the same imperfections as everybody else who tries to do any analysis in private equity. Okay, and the the kind of key metrics that you're I appreciate there's going to be lots of different elements that you look at when comparing a a PE firm, but um, you know I'm sure you know rate return is going to be a key uh, element of that from an LP perspective. But what are the kind of key areas that you're looking at when you're you know doing these uh, due diligence uh, on a on a PE firm? Fundamentally, we always ask the question of why do we analyze performance. And for me, from a due diligence standpoint, the only reason to look at past returns is to look for signs of skill. Because the investor is not going to buy past performance. They'll look for indication of where they should put their money going forward. And that should be informed by where there's skill that will likely translate into future outperformance. So with this in mind, we can basically look at the range of analysis that we perform. And we basically always look at indicators of such skill. Is this fund manager able to generate more value with their transactions than with similarly leveraged industry matched public market investments? Is this fund manager able to outperform other private equity firms doing similar things? Is this fund manager sufficiently niche positioned to avoid overcrowded segments of the private equity market? Is this fund manager able to mitigate the inherent risk in the type of deals that they've taken on? So you can go through the different type of things we're calculating. And every time we're doing this with a specific objective to identify something, which ideally both intuitively makes sense as a component of relevant skill. And then most importantly, something that I can also find in my empirical work to actually be related to performance. So every number we calculate as part of the Parox suite of analytics has been validated in my academic research as either a leading indicator of likely success or otherwise a stable trend of the fund manager that limited partners can look at and says, well, that's the flavor of private equity that's good for me. I identify this flavor in the past. And so likely I will get that flavor also in the next fund. Okay. And when you say those skills, are they, you know, quantifiable skills or is this based on, obviously comes from the data, the, the research that you get in this business performed at this level, it should have been here. What, and is that where you find a lot of the differentiating because this business overperformed, what, why did it overperform? And is that what you're looking for? Um, and looking for trends within the portfolio that clearly demonstrate that uh, these industries are overperforming under this private equity leadership or ownership or however you want to uh, coin the term? Well, it's a very interesting question. It's at the core and center of what I think differentiates us. It makes us still today, 10 years after the creation of the business, pretty unique in the market space out there. Basically, we only work off hard objective facts on the data. We don't make a single judgment call on the way from the data room to our analysis chart which allows us to work for both the general partners who want to present themselves in the market and then the limited partners who screen for opportunities. There, there is obviously an inherent conflict in working on both sides of that table, but as we are literally algorithmic, we can avoid any possible conflict there. Now, how can we do this? How can we objectively measure something that's inherently as subjective as strategy or deal flow? Right? I can't walk into anybody's office and measure the quality of their deal flow, but I can look at something in the data that may tell me something about it. And in this particular example, we look at the investment pattern of a private equity firm. How have they timed deals over time? Specifically, how many deals have they done quarter on quarter? Give a nice little activity curve over time with ebbs and flows of activity. We can look at this for one fund manager, and then we can look at the same variable for all private equity firms taken together, the entire universe of private equity. So we got two curves going up and down over time. And if the two are very similar, mathematically a high correlation, I call this pro-cyclical because that's a GP that's swimming with the stream that invests a lot when everybody is active and vice versa. However, if a GP is dancing at their own rhythm, they're not very correlated with what the others are doing and that pattern over time, low level of pro-cyclicality, I ask myself, why do we see this? And I would guess it's probably because they have some ability to generate their own deal flow so they're not subject to the same kind of deals being shopped around by the normal M&A banks as is the rest of the industry. So I'm picking up a signal that I think it could tell me something about proprietary deal flow, which hopefully makes intuitive sense. 
And then I take it to the data and I figure out over 20 years of data, can I say that those who are less pro-cyclical in my terminology actually outperform? And I find that this is the case. Not necessarily because there's a causal relationship, but it's just a fact of the asset class. So I'm picking up something that's performance relevant. And that probably is a signal for as a construct proprietary deal flow that is impossible to measure directly. So that's always the approach. We do mathematics. We do it based on a deep understanding of how private equity actually works. And that allows us to pick up these indicators of skill, which are never a perfect science, right? There are lots of exceptions to my empirical rule, but on the aggregate, these indicators allow you to identify with a good level of likelihood, the likely future outperformance. Interesting. So looking at that with, based on your, your research, if, if I am a, you know, you mentioned that you, you support both LPs with both looking at private equity firms and I find that fascinating, but also with P firms and how to position themselves um, and better. So to begin with, based on your kind of research, what would you recommend to an LP on how to identify a good private equity firm or, uh, you know, maybe we'll use the good versus bad for, for a better phrase there, but how, how would, what would you recommend to them um, for doing that research? Yeah. First thing is to be very clear what not to do. Don't look at IRRs. Okay. They tell you nothing about the, they tell you very little about the past because they're actually not even a good indicator of how much money was made in the past. And they certainly tell you nothing about the future because there's no empirical link anymore between past returns and IRR and future returns and IRR. Now, what do you look at? Well, you should probably think about this as an exercise to identify best in class managers. There's a huge range of private equity activity, different underlying assets, different styles. But if you're able to actually look at every fund manager out there and say, okay, what are they doing? Who else is doing this? And are they best at their game? That's a very, very intuitive and very powerful way to screen the market and always ask that question, which can be done algorithmically. It's one of the things that Parox does to identify, are you best in class? Because just looking at returns is, is not necessarily sufficient, just intuitively. If you look at the private equity market today, well, returns are dominated by certain trends of the last decade. Just pick on those guys who happen to have a great exposure to software buyouts. These were a really good idea in the, next ten, in the last 10 years. They may or may not be a good idea in the next 10 years, but the top quarter tends to be overpopulated by private equity firms who happen to have the specific focus. Well, that was a fantastic thing in the past. Uh, but within this group, then you can still ask the question, who is best at doing software buyouts? Because they all look good, but if you wanna build a best in class portfolio, you can identify the best at doing software buyouts. Let's do another extreme, let's do, um, traditional carbon-based energy buyout transactions. Another space of the market, substantially less popular these days with limited partners for a whole range of reasons. But unless an LP excludes exactly that market segment, if they look at it, they say, well, maybe I wanna be there, but many of the funds don't look top quartile, but still you can apply the same logic to say, let's look at this segment and find a best in class manager because at least where I'm sitting, I cannot necessarily predict which of the broad macro trends will be the most performing in the next decade. Others may have a view on this, but um, if you wanna have a broad coverage of all those segments, if you look at it segment by segment, try to find the best in class performer and there are actually methods and algorithms to help you do exactly that. Interesting. So if, uh, on the flip side, if I'm a private equity firm, um, you, know, you mentioned obviously about those uh, firms that have have rode a wave, you know, rightly or wrongly, they've performed well, they may have, you know, they may be at the top of that list, even though they've invested in software over the last 10 years, or, um, you know, been particular in, in life sciences as that has grown as sectors that we've seen um, uh, increase. But how, how would a PE firm better present themselves to an LP to demonstrate that they are a high performing firm, even though they haven't invested in software and therefore got a huge IRR rate, which obviously you mentioned wasn't the best way of, of, uh, of demonstrating a, a future returns? Well, I mean, the, the, the first part of the answer is, is very similar to what I just said from the LP perspective. The GP themselves can signal basically, I'm best at my game. Now you may not like this game, but if you want to have exposure to this type of private equity deal, we're your shop. 
That's okay. the first part of the answer. I think the other part of the answer for the general partner is just to be very clear what they really stand for and what they're really good at. And then go on the market and be bullish about it and attract the right pocket of capital. And even if you're a large private equity shop, so raising a fund that may be billions of dollars, but there's a huge ocean of capital out there. Often we do the analysis and we dissect exactly the positioning and we find something, for instance, a private equity fund manager having abnormally short duration. So a very short average holding period, which is one of the variables we're looking at as an ingredient of the performance measurement. And the private equity firm that often replies, yeah, Oliver, but, but LPs don't like this. And I said, well, some may not like it. Some may like it. Some may have the preference for a quick return, de-risking the asset, having the capital ready quickly for an investment, as long as the annual returns are strong. Others put money to work and they don't want to see it again for five, six, seven years. You as a GP need to understand your type and then be able to single it to attract the right limited partners. You don't need to convince every single LP in the world, but you need to have a very clear story about what you're good at, what makes you distinct, and be able to identify the type of LPs that may have an interest in exactly that type of risk return profile. Interesting. I can't help but think, you know, we've gone through a lot of internal brand communication, marketing communication, and how closely linked what you're saying would be of really understanding you as a business and then being able to communicate that. And I think there's too many, you know, you'll probably be better um, placed to, to, uh, to, to position this, but my opinion or personal opinion would be that there is too many firms that are fighting for what I'd regard as the middle ground and the general everything. Um, and then there's some firms that are beginning to stand out because they're saying, you know, we don't take everyone's capital. We specialize in this particular space is I think there's a, am I right in saying there's quite a close link between kind of what you're kind of communicating here and what I'd regard as your brand and marketing strategy that, that overalls that is that, kind of how, we're, would you agree with that link? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if our objective and our ambition is to be able to run those analytics to truly unearth the distinct value creation DNA of a fund manager. And there are two equally fascinating applications for this. The one is at the very, very top strategic level where frequently are being called in by the fund managers to say, let's do this assessment as the basis of figuring out where we wanna be heading as a fund manager. That's maybe a part of the conversation of saying, oh, is there really a distinct risk return profile in a subset of transactions that truly justify to be packaged in a separate fund vehicle and launch a new fund strategy rather than just taking the opportunity of bringing in another billion in AUM by doing something a little smaller than before or a little, little different geographically than before, but truly identify the corporate strategy if you want for the asset manager, for the GP, based on this analytical insight into what's the value creation DNA. The second application closely related is then of course, how does this firm present itself vis-a-vis -vis the investor base? And this is why in an ideal world, we get engaged with the fund manager probably half a year to a year before they're gonna be next hitting the market with a fundraise so that our analytics are fully understood and reflected upon in the, in the partnership, in the partner group of the GP, and then can be the very basis of the key communication so that the key messages that are gonna be sent to the LP base are uh, substantiated with, with uh, thorough and deep analytics. Okay, okay, that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, the, um, so this might be linked already to, to what we've already discussed, but what do you see as kind of the major mistakes uh, focused on the private equity firms here that they are, that you see them making on the market and what would you suggest to them to, to correct that? I, uh, I've been reading as a researcher um, tons and tons of fund documents because obviously this, this, these, are, these are shared with me uh, on a confidential basis to fuel my research. And I always say, you know, I kind of rip them apart in the sense that I take the numerical part and stick them in a database and I keep the prosa, the description of strategy and all this good stuff for bedtime reading. And I actually gave up bedtime reading uh, in, the, in this regard because I read that over time, they're all saying the same thing. And they're all saying what they believe or what their placement agents tell them the LPs want to hear. Um, and that makes them undistinguishable. And so if I put myself at the, at the limited partner's perspective, and I do see the market in some capacity also from, from the LP's eyes, um, I would read this and say, oh, there's another one of those. 
another one of those. And they all say the same thing. How do I get any categorization in there? Whom can I trust? And I think that's actually a big mistake of many fund managers. They all not only maybe are similar, but they're trying to look exactly the same. And few of them are actually daring and says, okay, we're different. And we want to be different and we believe in our strategy and we believe that this strategy is going to attract half a billion dollars for the next fund and we're going to go after it. And we have the courage of getting across as different out there in the marketplace. So we, we talk about that difference. And again, it's something that we went internally and looked at. Why are we different? Why is our business? Uh, one of the common questions I get asked by private equity firms, partners, when I'm talking to them either about recruiting for their firm or for their portfolio is, you know, what's your USP? Um, and and uh, we get we ask that a lot. And I usually say, look, I'm happy to answer that. Um, but as I'm potentially going to be representing you, what do you guys regard as your USP for your firm? Um, yep. And then I'll happily give you what ours is. And, and uh, you know, it, it's not a question that goes down particularly well, uh, it, nor is it particularly well answered. But what would you, how does somebody, you know, obviously working with you guys to be able to do that, but if is there a way that firms can begin to understand that for themselves and what their USP is? Um, or when they're filling out these fundraising documents and all the strategy side of things, what, what do you think good or what do you think, you know, exceptional looks like when that's start, that starting to happen? That might be quite a big co uh, conversation, but if I'm a managing partner of a firm, that's kind of the thing that I'd probably be wanting um, to know. It's a brilliant question. It's one that I don't have a ready-made answer for um, because it's also not directly related to what we can support analytically. Okay. I think um, a natural a way to approach this would be to ask the question, what's the type of a private equity deal that nobody on earth can do better than we as a GP? And then you can identify this based on a simple categorization based on industry and size, but you're probably not gonna get very far. And then you go into deal style and then you go to specific situation of possibly the transaction and or the transformation need of the target company. And I would believe, and I would basically expect as a limited partner, that a GP has to be able to answer that question. And if it's just like, oh, you know, we do healthcare buyouts because we've always done them and they seem to have been working, that shouldn't be enough. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So that I like. Yeah, they've got. I know that's a difficult one to answer straight off, but I think that question's uh, going to be pretty powerful. What deal do we we do that we nobody else can do better than us? Um, and then that driving is strategy. Very very briefly on on housekeeping. Um, I got a hungry cat in the background. Do you hear a bit of this meow meow? No. Okay. Cool. Then we can get that. <laughs> no worries. Um, so uh, um, uh, right, where were we? Right. So you've um, not only have you obviously we've explored a lot in the private equity world and, and gone through that, but also you've led driven this business. What was it that that, that brought you and led you to setting up this company and, and founding uh, the organization? Oh, it's uh, actually a great story. I, I, I was purely inspired by an advisory project. Um, you know, um, Pemira, the big, uh, the big uh, blue chip European fund manager, had hired me back in 2011 um, to basically apply some of my mathematics as a researcher on their track record in this explicit search of kind of self-identification, self-discovery. And there are two other equally uh, prominent GPs at the same time from similar mandates, but they still chose to, to remain anonymous. Um, and Pimira at the end of this mandate basically took a part of my work and copy pasted this in the 2012 PPM labeled as this is done by Professor Gottschalk. So I called them up and said, first of all, guys, thank you. I'm really flattered that you're doing this, but then why are you doing it? Because you guys are Pimira. You certainly don't need my name for anything. And their answer was, essentially the starting point of the Parrots business, because they said something along the lines of, yeah, it's true, we're Primera, but we're also a GP in fundraising. And every skeptical LP will inherently question every number we put forward, every method we choose, every benchmark we select, because they know we're in marketing mode. If we, Primera, subject ourselves to your academic methodology, the industry knows that you're not writing in the Journal of Financial Economics to make one of us look better or worse than the others, that gives the numbers external validation, and that makes it reliable. You bring tons of value. 
And so I gave me some pause and I asked around the context in the industry and they said, yeah, it would be super powerful if there was a Carfax, a good housekeeping center of approval that would basically standardize some of the key quantitative parts of due diligence as a service provider to private equity. So I was a happy academic and, and uh, consultant uh, on my own. And I always shied away from the responsibility of actually creating a business with responsibility for payroll and other people. But that opportunity seemed so promising and interesting to me that I basically took a sabbatical from my academic obligation, programmed out the software, built the core methodology, found my founding partner, and we started to then test market it. And we really got off the ground as we got fantastic traction by the very large reputable private equity firms we then basically spoke to. And the KKR conversation comes to mind where Scott Nuttall at the time sat down with us and we were half into our pitch. And he literally cut me off and said, Oliver, stop, I'm sold. We've been waiting for this to happen for a long, long time. We have always been looking at the rating agencies to do something like this, but they're not interested. They're not getting private equity. This is structurally important for the asset class. And we, KKR, would love to become basically your first client because you have a classical chicken and egg problem. We have the ability to volunteer to be the first chicken to get you off the ground. And he did not say this because he was eager to kind of steal half a billion commitments from the guy down the street or up and down 9 West 57. But he basically said this for systemic reasons. He said, Oliver, this will up the game of private equity. This will push the boundaries and get the asset class out of this possible criticism where performance measures are questionable, the benchmarks are all over the place, there is no risk measure, and really help us to attract more capital to the asset class. And hey, we're KKR. If that asset class doubles, we'll get a nice chunk of it. And that was basically their rationale. And based on that feedback, I said, okay, there's definitely a there there. Let's run at it and see how far we can take it. Interesting. So I find that fascinating how you're this kind of, uh, whether it's new or a newer concept or an additional concept to what, um, uh, what's been done previously, it's started with the big players, which is yep. usually not how private equity changes and emerges. In my experience, it usually starts with your, well, we see something happening in venture, we see something happening in small cap, um, and then your big players run on. But, you know, Premier looks like they've kind of um, kicked off and, and create not create a business for you, but giving you a proof of concept. Um, and uh, and then companies like KKR have come in and, and been looking for it. So that's that's really interesting. I'm I'm not heard of anything in private equity that's worked what I regard as the other way than uh, than what it would usually run through. Yeah, it's a it's it's a bit of a conscious choice because I mean, if we were really out there to set a better standard, we basically said we have to get traction from the top. Right? We have to market to the big guys and, and soon thereafter, the likes of a CDNR and the Nordic Capital followed along. Um, and by now we basically can say that we've been working for seven of the top 10 GPs in the world, wow. 26 of the top 100. So it's, a, it's come over the 10 years to be, to be overrepresented still in the, in the large end of the segment because we said we have to set a standard for this to have any traction. We're gonna be close to the GPs. They will give us exposure to the big LPs that gets us to leading industry bodies such as the ILPA, with whom we have a very close relationship. And eventually it's gonna trigger through because if the LPs get it, they will suggest it to the rest of the market. And then we may have a chance to set a standard. Now, it's, too, it's been 10 years, it's still too early to declare victory, still lots of people to convince and to, and to uh, change and to evangelize, but we're extremely encouraged by the success we had so far. Interesting. And you, you mentioned, obviously, declaration of victories a bit early at the moment. Your business has been through a bit of a transition early this year. And if you're listening to this, that's kind of uh, we're in March 2021. And, and you went through a bit of a uh, an acquisition um, mm -hmm. from MJ Hudson. Um, so I understand from our offline discussions that this isn't a, a closing piece for you. It's a it's, it's, uh, beginning uh, or a new beginning. So tell us a bit about why you've gone through that process to what was that process like? You know, everyone's always on, we're on the other side of the table, acquiring businesses, selling businesses, but as a founder, business, a founder and then going through a, a process of being acquired. Um, so yeah, let's, let's discuss those two. A, a fantastic experience, a good experience. Um, and to back up, we've been approached uh, repeatedly, I think overall six, seven times by very serious players over the last decade who, who looked at Parox with a desire to possibly um, acquire us or, or partner up with us. Um, there was also has been the opportunity possibly to take in kind of third party 
well, fintech VC capital to capitalize the business. But until late last year, I've been deciding to grow it purely organically. Um, first and foremost, because I want to be patient enough to see when the right situation is in the market to really scale up and not be on a fixed clock with VC funding. And then also be very selective of who to partner with. Because if somebody uh, you know, just puts money in the business, I still have to do all the work. Um, it's good to have a company with a full bank account, but um, that's only solving part of the problem. And last year, which actually was the best Parox year ever for a variety of reasons, um, we were approached by three partners. And we've chosen MJ Hudson, not only because I'd, I'd known the people for some time and they were just, just good people, but also because the thesis was compatible with what I'd like to see for the business, namely giving it the right platform to dramatically accelerate growth and fully establish it as a standard. So it's been very much continuation of the team, of the business model, of the thesis, but with the much broader infrastructure of MJ Hudson, who has this entire suite of, of service offerings for LPs and GPs in alternative space. And I, as the founder, basically now have the ability to hand over lots of the stuff that, frankly, I don't enjoy so much, the payroll and the taxes and the accounting and the legal and the ugly website that we had so far um, and the ugly charts that I draw as a, as a, as a professor, um, all of this is now taken care of being dramatically improved and we can draw on better resources and more resources for the analytics and for the commercialization of the business. So as such, it's sort of all a sell, but really putting the business on a, on a, on a better platform. I have kind of equity-like incentives in the medium and very long term for what I want to be doing on the MG Hudson platform. And so far, we're off to a fantastic start in that setup. That's, that's interesting. I think you've talked a lot about there, about what you wanted for the business, what you wanted to achieve and what you wanted to get to. And I think there's, um, you know, I think there's a little bit in private equity where we talk and focus too much on, you know, the valuation of the business and that being the important part. But when we go from, you know, it doesn't make much sense from a private equity to private equity deal, but from a founder um, first time PE acquisition, understanding the critical what does the founder, what does the current owner want the business to achieve? What do they want to do? What do they want it to happen? Um, and I think, you know, we look at, oh, why did we lose that deal? Oh, it's because, you know, someone came in and offered more or whatever else. Um, I think there's not enough conversation around actually what does the owner want? I may be wrong with that and people would say it, but uh, I think understanding that um, is key. And I think that's probably why you've gone with MJ Hudson is they align with what you want the business to do, what you want to achieve if I'm right there. Yeah, it, it has lots of parallels with, with what private equity firms will often tell you, right? I would probably have been able to cash in a bigger check in the short term had I gone with one of the other offerings. But if it's the right chemistry there with the acquirer, that's what private equity firms are all about, understanding what the founder really wants, maybe building bridges, having a long-term perspective also for the founder, make sure the best thing will happen to the business that the founder created. All of this, at the, at the end of the day, more important than, you know, the... the check in the bank account, because at the end of the day, we can also all eat no much more than one schnitzel per day. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, so I, I do think that's an important point is that understanding of that. And, and you can see how, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that it's not just about, I would have earned, I could have earned more potentially through something, um, another uh, exit in a, in a different business. I think there's a, there's a key point there of under, of that real questioning and understanding as opposed to looking just on the, on the deal. So looking at, at talent. And that just, if I, oh, sorry, if, no, if go ahead. I like on this point, that is a privilege of a uh, founder run and owned business. Because the moment you take in third party capital, you all of a sudden have a fiduciary duty to make sure you work on their best interest and their, for usually really good reasons, have a largely financially driven objective function. So that changes then everything. So that, that's something I consider a big, a big a great privilege as we're going through the negotiations. Yeah, it's an interesting one as that founder becomes, as soon as that private equity deal comes in, you've got a, you've got a boss again, the whole, the whole concept changes. Uh, you know, certainly as an executive search firm, we see a lot of that. The founder wants to stay on, they partner with private equity, the whole landscape changes, you know, you're putting into an uncomfortable position, obviously you're not in that situation, but that, that we do see a lot of, okay, move into a technical role, move into a board role, let's put you as a chairman, let's put you as something else, because we want to retain yep. the concepts and everything that you've got in your mind, but uh, uh, generally this business is going to grow uh, significantly, or we're going to change a lot of things, and clearly you're not going to be happy with it, so uh, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a key, uh, key perspective. So, 
from from your and this is interesting because both your founder um you know you kind of grew a business when the probably goal wasn't that name wasn't that until that kind of premiere kind of conversation had and then inspired that and we all get inspirations from different places what do you feel from what the work that you've done the the kind of three key attributes that uh, align with a, with a top performer um from from your perspective uh, top performing private equity for what that is so yeah, both. In fact, yeah. Let me let me clarify that. So, what do you what are your kind of um, you know three attributes of a top performing private equity um, uh, business? Um, focused on a specific niche in private equity land that is not overcrowded by lots of other capital chasing that market. Having the ability and having found some formula to do that particular deep deal type better than others and being disciplined enough that whatever they do in terms of growing AUM or expanding the franchise does not take them too far away from that strength. It comes down to that marketing, clear brand marketing message again and and strategy um, of uh, of what they're looking to do. And what do you love about private equity from an outsider looking in? And also, if hate's too much of a strong word, what do you dislike about the private equity industry? Oh, it's actually the same thing. It's okay. data availability. Right. The, the, the researcher in me hates the challenges to get data uh, on private equity because um, I'd love to see much more and deeper and better data to understand the asset class even better. At the other point, it creates fantastic opportunities for those who actually understand the asset class. I sometimes both, you know, in my team, when we're trying to figure out complex analyses and, and vis-a-vis clients, if something challenging comes up, I said, well, if that was easy, everybody could do it. And from the investor perspective, you know, um, yes, uh, it's not my cup of tea. Maybe I just don't know enough about it. But um, if you're investing in the liquid markets, you have perfect data, you have lots of established me- measures, there are certainly very smart people doing great things there. But from my understanding, the ability to move the needle, the alpha creation possible potential there is substantially lower because these are much more efficient, easier to play markets. In private equity, you really can have make a difference, both as the GP who operates in distinct transactions with the ability to just understand a business better than others, run with this understanding, improve it, and, and create lots of value. And also from the limited partners perspective, if you really know how to play the asset class, how to put capital to work, how to incentivize people rightly, and how to find the right fund manager. That's what makes me passionate about private equity because it is still relatively under-researched and poorly understood compared to other asset classes that satisfies my kind of academic curiosity and and desire at the same time as an entrepreneur there's a huge opportunity to create value by allowing lps and gps to communicate more effectively and create a more data-driven vocabulary for them to get to the matchmaking so that the right investors end up in the right funds and the and the data piece do you you, do you perceive that data as as being there and recorded for the PE firms or do you believe that it is the but not shared or do you think it is data that that they are not measuring and they're not you know considering or a bit of both um i think it varies at the at the upper end the more professional end of the private equity market a good amount of information is being collected and analyzed just because the GP needs to do their job right. Now then their private equity firms differ in their degree of which they're transparent to share this with the limited partners, but this is also getting better. They're still reluctant to share it with the general public, but then frankly, you know, Joe Doe on the street doesn't need to know the EBITDA margins of the last deal of the private equity house somewhere in Park Avenue. Um, so that's less, of a, that's less of a concern at this uh, stage. Um, it's more, about understanding what to do with this data and to draw the right conclusions for it. And this is where, you know, just data systems, databases, right, software firms come in and focusing on how to make the whole information flow between LP and GP more effective. And that's where, you know, little Parax also comes in with our advanced analytics. Okay. And the, uh, so where, where do you get your influences, you know, being a, as a self-proclaimed kind of on the acad- academic side um, as we as we discussed at the start, where do you get your influences? What do you read? What do you watch? What do you listen? Where does your um, you know your your influences come? Um, I from the get go as an academic, I've been extremely close to practice. 
Um, and this goes back to my experience as a PhD student. So I was I'm an old uh, Bain consultant, strategy consultant after my after my MBA. They threw me out of total coincidence into their private equity practice. So I saw a buyout from that perspective for the first time. Um, then I changed career paths a little bit, even though I, I love the company and, and my colleagues at Bain, um, went into academia, and I then wanted to study private equity. And two years into my PhD at INSEAD and Wharton, I found out there are lots of really important questions still open on private equity. And there's a very good reason they're open because nobody ever got the data to address them. So I basically then said, okay, I have to find somehow, some way to find data on this asset class. And the only way to get proprietary data is to give the people you talk to the hope or illusion that you're actually gonna be able to do meaningful things with their data. So from the get-go, I thought, okay, how can I engage with the practitioners? How can I do something methodologically that actually helps them better make better investment decisions? This was a nucleus of the whole Parox concept and methodology. So I've been very, very close to practice. So um, yes, of course, I you know get my inspiration from academic literature and from, from seeing what other researchers are doing. But first and foremost, I walk through private equity village with my eyes and ears open to figure out, okay, what are people's challenges? What are the new trends? How can my type of stuff, the analytics, data, methods, research, be helpful to shed light on the asset class, improve decision-making, and just improve the general understanding of it? Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd think from a private equity in industry, you'd think data heavy, you think huge amounts, but it's interesting here from your perspective where it's like, we're not quantifying enough of the data. Um, oh, but again, I always, I, I always uh, um, interrupt people impolitely when they ask me, oh, wow, what do you think about big data and private equity? And said, there ain't no big data and private equity. <laughs> you can be happy if you have any data on private equity. And my mantra is you got to take this data and make it smart data. So it actually tells you something, but there's no big data. It's, it's very simple. Like we, we still can run the whole calculations on a, on a, on a, on a smartphone. Um, you don't need super powered computers on the, on the web to do most of the stuff. It's it's very few data points with very simple math to get you still the right answer. Interesting. So um, Oliver, if anybody wanted to is listening to this and thinking, do you know what, we're about to run a fundraise, we could do with Oliver coming in and, and um, unlocking some of this data, helping us with our strategy or just to generally reach out, um, what's the best way of somebody um, messaging it? <laughs> well, um, I, I fortunately, unfortunately, have this unpronounceable German last name. So if you ever look for Gottschalk and private equity in any search uh, engine, you'll probably find some email of mine and, and, and very, very happy to, to get in touch with folks. You'll probably find me best for the school at HEC. Um, and if anybody has research ideas, uh, suggestions of what to work on, or, or uh, possibly a desire to explore uh, something on the analytical side, very, very happy to hear from them. Absolutely. Well, we will put all the contact details in. Um, I did have to confirm twice how to pronounce your surname before the call to make sure I got that right. So I will add uh, add that in. So we will add all of that in. If you want to get in touch with Oliver, we'll put the contact, put your LinkedIn profile in there um, to stop people uh, trying to work out how to spell that surname. Um, and uh, we'll put all that in in the notes. So, but look, thank you very much for joining us, Oliver. It's given a really good insight into uh, private equity. I think anybody who's a private equity partner, managing partner uh, that wants to kind of differentiate themselves a little bit is about to raise a fund there's a ton of value here so thank you very much for sharing that my great pleasure thank you and as always thank you very much for those who are joining and listening in and of course if you ever need support with your private equity professionals or portfolio executives with hiring please do reach out to me at raw selection and we'll be happy to help but uh if um let me do that again Please do subscribe also to the podcast and you'll get notified of the next one. But till the next time, keep smashing it and we'll speak again soon. Thank you for listening to the Private Equity Podcast on www.raw-selection.com.